Hello and welcome to the Ossington Circle. I'm your host, Justin Poder. Today I'm with architectural researcher Susie Harris Brantz. We'll be talking about architecture, occupation, and resistance. Susie, thank you for being with us today. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, Susie, you did an uh, architecture, you were an architect in residence at decolonizing architecture, which was in I, I, Israel-Palestine. Can you talk a bit about that group, what they do, what you did there? Yep, uh, decolonizing architecture is a collective of architects and artists. Uh, it's also an, a residency. It was established by Al Weissman, Alessandro Petty, and Sandy Halal, and they're based in Betzahur in the West Bank. Uh, I was an architect in residence there in the summers of 2010 and 2011. And our work during that specific period was looking at the discrepancies between abstract negotiation documents and the boundaries they produce and their manifestations on the ground. And how, in many instances, a map, a cartographic document from, say, a negotiation or um, the Jerusalem municipal boundary line, was the second one we we're looking at, how, when you look at them at the scale of the landscape, they invariably bisect towns, villages, individual properties, and even buildings, such as in the instance of the first summer, the Oslo line of Area C bisected a specific house we were researching. And in the case of 2011, we were looking at how the Jerusalem municipal boundary line bisects the, what would have been the Palestinian parliament building in East Jerusalem. So this is um, the people who look at the Israel-Palestine conflict, or they follow it in the, uh, in the media, they, we, we're always confronted with Israel making generous offers with an endless negotiation. So what you're, what you're doing is you're saying, let's look at what these offers, what these negotiations concretely mean in terms of the arrangement of space. Mm -hmm. yeah? And I think there's a couple facets to that, one of which is exactly what you're talking about, which is how those documents manifest themselves in actuality on the ground. And what ends up happening there is what's presumed to be, say, a, a benchmark in the negotiations. Mm -hmm. The next round or the next level of negotiations, which is not talked about, occurs on the ground, I would argue, occurs when you then take this abstract artifact and look at its implications at a much more zoomed in scale. And that's when certain problems arise that may not have arised otherwise. And in some ways it, it introduces a whole new level of complication, but also an opportunity for unforeseen intervention. So for a new a new way of mitigating the landscape or engaging with that conflict. So in the case of, say, specific boundary lines, they themselves can become, in the words of A.L. Weissman, I guess, elastic. They can mm -hmm. expand and contract as people build or work within those ambiguities on the ground. Right. So I'm, I'm going to mention a bit more about this book, but I, before I knew about your work, I had read A.L. Weissman's book, Ho Hollow Land, and... I thought that was an incredible book because he he looks at the the conflict in very interesting ways. Like there's a chapter on the way the Israeli military um, analyzed Nablus and the and mm -hmm. Balata refugee camp and the way they mapped their the way they made their way through uh, that space in order to defeat the Palestinian fighters that were there. Um, the relationship between settlers and settlements and military mm -hmm. blocks and fortresses and the way that networks of fortresses are used to to conquer the land. Um, but your work, you actually talk about, so on the one hand, uh, Ayal's saying architecture can be used as a tool of the occupation, a, yes. a kind of weapon, but you're, you're saying uh, that architects and and architecture can also afford a kind of, ta you, the term you use, I think, is tactical agency mm -hmm. to the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. How does that work? Yeah, I think that there's a bunch of interesting things to pick up on there. One of which is I think AL did a wonderful job of 
bringing more attention to the architectural discipline of things such as conflict urbanism, the sorts of things you're talking about, how warfare enters the city and uses the built form not just as a backdrop and staging for that event, but it becomes integral to the warfare itself and its development. And uh, I was, if, if say his work was specifically dissecting those kind of modus of operation, modus of power that rested on the governmental militaristic side, I personally became quite interested in how individuals could also enter into that arena and have a form of agency uh, afforded to them. So and you use this term, political progenies, mm -hmm. um, which is about people trying to take action outside of a context of a formal negotiation, right? Absolutely. And I think that exactly this ties into what we were talking about with regards to the negotiations, how a window of opportunity exists within that ambiguity of what is normally considered a frozen time, but as we very well all know, is not frozen at all. And in fact, may be the period when the most developments take place. It's what? usually during the stasis that the settlements are rapidly developed. Which is what Israel calls creating facts on the ground. Absolutely. Yeah. And so how challenging or refuting that there would be this strict dyad between the Israeli side and Palestinian side as the only actors in this conflict at a governmental level and that there may be an opportunity for other actors to become involved and indeed they already exist, whether they're international, local, um, civilian or non-civilian based. So what I found so fascinating about your uh, research um, was that you talk about um, these design tactics. So the idea is that there are, and, and it's, no, it's got nothing to do with violence, it's got nothing to do with, um, you know, any kind of violent resistance the way we would, we would uh, think about it, but it's ways of empower, I think of it as ways of empowering a people that are under occupation in a totally unusual kind of way. So the first one that I found fascinating was what you called extraterritorial appropriation. So mm -hmm. the Palestinians are being surrounded by these walls, they're being cut off from their agricultural lands, but, but you don't have to be on your land to make use of your land. So yes. can you, can you uh, tell, mm -hmm. tell us a bit about this? Yes, and I say if I first step back and say why I became a little bit interested in landscape was in that I found that most of the capacity to impact change in the occupation was in these unoccupied areas. And I became very interested in trying to understand how landscape also, like architecture, becomes a mechanism of power retention and control in the conflict. And so most of my research would involve dissecting how power was operating through landscape and then finding moments of subversion mm -hmm. where both the absurdity of the kind of ardent attempt to keep power and segregation so strong could be challenged, and also where everyday practices could start to provide a moment of uh, political agency. So in, in the particular tactic that you're speaking about, I was looking at the most controlled and le most restricted areas of the West Bank, uh, closed military zones, the peripheries around the settlements, areas where physical ground access is completely prohibited and trespassing in some instances has a, a shoot to kill policy so the army can kill any Palestinian entering into this area. And these areas actually constitute vast quantities of the land of the West Bank and while they may appear to be vacant fields and very banal, they can become quite charged and in many instances these areas are what become uh, the future slated areas for the settlements themselves. So yes, as you said, I was trying to find a way to activate these areas and in all of the restrictions on such areas, the presumption is that physical ground access would be what is being prohibited. And so I wanted to think about ways of activating extraterritorially. And if, uh, if I could start to think of some of the processes in the West Bank that could really couple political agency with landscape and with the economy, one of the practices that came to mind was apiaries or beekeeping practices, which have a long history in the West Bank. Uh, 
but had fallen to the wayside because of the lack of immobility, the inability to bring the apiary hives from, say, one area of nectar collection in Gaza during the uh, lemon harvest and then back to the West Bank. And so if you could take these large swaths of inaccessible land and charge them and make them an integral part of the apiary process, then that would give them a new form of activation, one that doesn't rely on human inhabitation, but uses as a proxy the bees as the kind of colonization or reappropriation of these territories. And um, in line with that, I guess I should say that one of the reasons apiaries haven't been activated in the West Bank is due to the strict restrictions on cultivation, which limit what types of cultivation can take place and if land is not properly cultivated, if Maryland is not managed in a certain manner, the state can confiscate it for lack of official cultivation. And so this has been a huge hindrance on things like apiaries. And so if there's a, a large swath of land that has no cultivation restrictions because it's technically completely off territories and closed uh, as it rests, this became a way of looking at activating that land. And it, it was further charged by the type of flowers that were used for this nectar creation, which were a large list of Israeli protected wildflowers. And so if I draw back to that idea of kind of pointing out the absurdity of the strong restrictions of the occupation, we start to think of what would be the logical response sequence in this, and, and would, it, would Israel, upon hearing about such an initiative, do what, do call its own protected wildflowers, have the checkpoints for the bees. Yeah, and so always looking at how you could take a, a sincere situation and kind of elucidate mm -hmm. its complexities and, and uh, its underlying absurdities. And I also kind of like the idea of, uh, in one way, riding the tension between what would be a very pragmatic proposal for, say, agricultural amplification and uh, a reconceptualization of territorial activation, with that of a, say, art, art installation or landscape installation. And so we start to see if all of these flowers could bloom simultaneously in the spring. The landscape itself becomes a visual register of these closed areas where large swaths of red bands of flowers or whatever visually register all of the lands currently restricted. Yeah, mm -hmm. And another, another occupation tactic and resistance tactic uh, that you talk about. So the occupation, um, they attack sewage infrastructure, they attack um, the waste, the uh, ability for Palestinian uh, institutions to deal with waste, um, human waste, solid waste, and so on. Um, you talk about ways that the waste disposal problem could be turned into a solution. Yes, and uh Anyone that's been to the West Bank will immediately take note of the amount of unauthorized and online dumping sites and just random garbage that can be found throughout this otherwise stunningly scenic landscape. And many people have commented on the, oh, this is such a shame, it needs to be cleaned up. And I think perhaps more than offering a critique on its potential sanitation issues and its aesthetic eyesore Quality. quality. I was interested in really probing at its underlying causes, which as we all know will become and are integrally tied to the occupation itself. And uh, the responsibility of Israel as occupier is to provide all of the infrastructural services for the health and well-being of its occupied population. And so in many ways to kind of propose the kind of the polishing up and the removal of this garbage, tucking it under the rug, is not addressing any of the core reasons of its existence in the first place. So I was interested in looking at how you could first fully understand and dissect that waste process and some of its underlying causes, things such as checkpoint closures, incapacity to um, manage local waste, um, poor infrastructure, all the things we've just mentioned and then how you could augment that process or re-choreograph it in a way that would not only alleviate some of the health issues related to that, but could also be used as a political tactic in and of itself. And so I looked, 
at where the dumping was taking place. Most of the dumping that currently exists happens on private farmland and in line with, again, with the, the assignments of the 1858 Ottoman Land Code. If your land is not cultivated for three years, it can be seized by the state. And so when these garbage is dumped on these sites, these owners are there at risk of having their land taken. And so there was, in a way, something quite practical about a local waste management system if it could only be manipulated to work more in favor of the inhabitants. And so I wanted to think about decoupling the organic, con organic content of the garbage from the sincere garbage that would need to go to, say, a landfill. If you could cut out that 60% of organic waste and deal with it locally, it would free up a lot of the traffic, the costs associated with waste removal, uh, alleviate the checkpoints, road systems, everything like that. And so what would we do if we had this 60% of waste local uh, and had to manage it? And I wanted to think about what if instead of dumping it on these privately owned lands that are at risk of losing their capacity to be cultivated, we looked at what is visually indistinguishable in the landscape, what is called state land. And these are parcels of land that are, tend to be rocky, but that Israel appropriated after a land survey, either due to absentee ownership, lack of cultivation, or military seizure. And these areas currently sit dormant adjacent to the lands that are privately owned and farmed. So if you could take this waste, mix it with a growth base, put it into what I call kind of an organic growing sack, this itself could then become an armature, a landscape armature. So you build up these blocks on the state land and they become this landscape built form and armature that now has the capacity to reclaim state land that would otherwise be unutilized. And so this tactic I explored through multiple phases, the first of which is just the managing of the waste, offering a local solution for waste on the organic level. And then the second stage is looking like, okay, well, now that we're able to manage the waste locally, can we do it in a way that resists erosion on these most uh, at-risk areas of erosion? And can the bags then, because they are a nutrient-rich source of uh, organic waste, can they start to grow and offer new grazing opportunities. As we know, the West Bank's land restrictions and land access restrictions have also greatly impacted grazing restrictions, where the few areas that remain available for grazing become highly overgrazed. So how could we take areas traditionally quite rocky, resist their erosion, provide a new area for grazing, and then in the final of this kind of uh, pushing them into the kind of architectonic realm of this tactic, how could you set up temporary pavilions? If you, if you overlay this landscape armature with a, a series of connection points for temporary tent pavilions, that becomes an ephemeral way of building in an area where you could otherwise not build. So you could set up a shelter, bring it to site, whether it's for a temporary market pavilion or for a rest stop for farmers during the hot hours of the summer and then take it down so it resists demolition. And then if we again go back to that idea of the kind of um, subversion or the, the ultimate um, absurdity of the occupation, anything, any of this initiative that would be demolished would involve demolishing organic waste, which would be the turning of organic matter, which frequently would happen anyways. And so looking at the kind of always, always addressing that worst case scenario rather than Fingers crossed, they don't do anything. Kind of, isn't it? And, and this is an ecological idea, which is that there's no such thing as waste. There's only things that are out of their proper place. And so you can take this problem and, and turn it into a resource that, that makes lands that are barren into living, grazing resources again. Uh, one, a third tactic. Um, I, I believe, if I understand, it has to do with these areas that have been just the settlements that have been vacated or areas that have been sort of house destroyed. Demolitions. Houses that have been, ah, okay, so it's Palestinian houses yes. that have been demolished. So Palestinian houses that have been demolished and Israel says you will not build here again. It, it, the demolition is not just a physical demolition but also a kind of a legal statement of you're not to build here again. So that's how right. can how can an area how can a house that's been demolished be 
reclaimed or, or used? Yes. And what, what I saw to be one of the most damaging aspects of the occupation, which is not as well known, is the house demolition policy, where Israeli building permits to build in Area C are very rarely granted, and many families have to build or build without following the procedure of getting a permit because they know uh, it will be too prohibitive for them whether they don't have the proper land title ownership so they have to get a survey done of the property it can become quite expensive and cumbersome and so Israel targets these properties in strategic areas for lack of permit and just demolishes their houses and there's been many initiatives that have looked into rebuild these houses multiple times especially in East Jerusalem um, the Israeli coalition against house demolitions is very active in this regard and I wanted to look at the houses that are are completely abandoned that are left as piles of rubble on the landscape and start to really probe at what that definition of built versus unbuilt means and how these sites in their dormant form could become reactivated or re-engaged and, and along the process of that on a, on a higher level really start to challenge what as I say what is built and not built and so I thought that there could be an opportunity to couple this most destructive of forces in the occupation with one of the other most challenging aspects of the occupation, which is the lack of infrastructure for sewage and waste management, and how uh, if you could somehow pair the two together, this could become a way of activating these sites as a new form of infrastructure. And so if I just try and think which way is best to talk about this, if I talk about the waste sewage management in the West Bank. So looking at sewage management in the West Bank, most of the infrastructure that exists is completely failing. You have cisterns and uh, waste tanks that are cracking and leaking, and more likely, even when they are pumped out, their suspects are pumped out, they're just dumped into open valleys. So there's no treatment measure at all for any of this waste. Well, in, in, in our part of the world, there's a, in environmental studies or environmental science, there's an idea of using a constructed wetland. So instead of an yes. engineering type of solution where you're using heavy-duty chemicals and mechanical engineering processes, you're actually doing what nature does, which is construct uh, an artificial wetland, which turns out to be in a very effective filter for, um, for water. Absolutely. So this is what sparked my interest in using the demolition rubble of these abandoned sites. So if you could simply rearrange the contents of a site, if you could take the exact same building rubble and restructure it, most of the time these properties are on, say, terraced lands where the demolition debris also falls down into the neighboring agricultural terraces. So if you could structure that rubble to have the largest, most uh, chunky pieces of aggregate at the top, then have varying degrees of filtration, you know, the smaller aggregate, then down to a series of phytoremediation plant ponds. Then this sewage that would otherwise be dumped in the adjacent open valley could become, a, could naturally become treated, could start to filter through this construct of rearranged debris. And so then it starts to beg the question, is this a new site? Is this new construction? At what point is this considered reconstruction? Is this simple rearrangement of the contents constituted as reconstruction? If and then reconstruction, then the then it can be redemolished. It. <laughs> right. And so then, going back to the absurdity, is do they come to demolish the site of demolition debris and sewage, right. and how would such a thing even take place? And so. In all of the three, I was very interested in how everyday practices could become politically charged through minor augmentations in their existing uh, procedures. How you could take something, tweak it, and that could be a way of Im imbuing political agency into it. But that it wouldn't involve a complete separation from what 
would be needed in a day-to-day -day operation. So if you think of some of the protests in the West Bank that are quite effective, they still involve a time commitment in the sense that people usually will have to put aside something else that they're doing to go and protest the construction of the wall, something like this. So is there a way to have that as one form of activi activism, but another that looks at supercharging day-to-day -day activities? Well, one thing that I liked, the title of your thesis is Contesting Limits. And the idea of looking for tactics in a contest, because whether it's nonviolent like the strategies you're proposing, or any kind of resistance to oppression, it is a contest, and you do have to take into account what your opponent or your oppressor is going to do. And so in each of these tactics, I, I thought, it seemed to me that that was very much part of your thinking, was that the, whenever there is any kind of resistance, there's going to be a response from the more yes. powerful side. And if you take that into account, you're a better tactician for it. Yes, absolutely. I think for me it was important not to, to aim to make things just better and hope for the best. Yeah hope that they wouldn't demolish it or try to be sneaky so that they maybe wouldn't see it. I think it's quite clear who has the upper hand in power in this occupation mm -hmm. and given the time frame of in, uh, investigation that I was personally looking at, that's not going to change. So I was looking at a series of approaches that could accept that current status quo and operate within it or find, find out what exactly it means to operate within it, I should say. And that, that's itself an interesting question, which maybe we can, we can uh, conclude on, which is in a, in a, in a movement or a, a, when you're trying to support uh, a group of people like the Palestinians who are dispossessed and who are um, resisting to try to hold their land and, and, and survive, you, um, you're, you know, people... People like us, we're not Palestinians, we're outsiders, we're, we're interested in, in principles of solidarity or, or mm -hmm. human rights, or we're motivated by um, some kind of principle. Uh, but how do, you, how do you see the role of somebody like an architect in a, in a situation like that? Mm -hmm. And I think, I think the role of the architect is particularly interesting to look at in this conflict because it is such a territorially charged conflict. And as soon as you get into any notion of territory and power mm -hmm. and building on land, architects will become implicated. So in one line, there's, there's a huge implication of architects that may not even be cognizant of their involvement, that profess to be apolitical and just being enlisted to do the work of their clients or the government and are just following the law. And so you get then another stream that says, what does it mean? If, if the architect has a unique responsibility to society as a profession, uh, what does that mean when you're in a condition of military occupation where the, the laws are so skewed? Who is our client? If there is no client, where does our moral obligation lie? Is moral obligation an onus to follow the rule of the law? Is moral obligation an onus to to serve a civilian population. And then this is, I think, what becomes quite interesting in terms of official professional architects practicing under the occupation and raises broader questions for their involvement. And then I would say as a separate category, as architects researching and trying to elucidate the complexities of the conflict, we have the unique capacity to really dissect and understand the spatial complexities of the conflict. And AL has done a lot of work to show the three-dimensionality of the occupation and how, in many ways, it's an unprecedented condition. And I think the final one is just as an architect, as activist, I think that's where we have a really unique ability to offer our skills and offer our understanding of spatial, the spatial implications of the conflict to the general public who may not see things a certain way, so we can elucidate things so that they can be seen in a more spatial or more, dissect that complexity so that it's more digestible to those willing to learn about it.
And then also I think it ties into the aesthetics of the occupation. You know, everything we build, and if you, the Israeli filmmaker Ail Savan talks about the generation of the image of Palestine to, to ascribe to the Zionist mandate and the notion of making a landscape that matches that of the Bible to fit into that narrative. And I think architecture and landscape have a huge role to play in that and how we as the kind of orchestrators and managers of that as landscape architects, architects, urban designers are obviously implicated in how that develops. And I think that that point generalizes. Like I think of, you know, I've done some work with geographic information mm -hmm. systems and mapping and maps are also not neutral. Or, uh, you know, I like to read history and history as a field is certainly not neutral. And so any, any field has this quality where you, you have a, a professional uh, moral obligation in yes. which, on the one hand, professionally, you're being led to, to conform. And on the other hand, you, you might have been taught at some point that you have some higher obligation to mm -hmm. principles or, or something larger than and your narrow uh, rules-based practice. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, like I said, I mentioned Ayal Wiseman's book, Hollow Land. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic book. He's, as uh, Susie mentioned, part of this decolonizing architecture group. And um, this, this book is fantastic. It's in the same kinds of traditions, and it has the same kinds of stunning visuals that uh, someone like me who's used to, you know, fairly bland <laughs> reading and, and, and writing um, is, I found that quite stunning, as I found your research okay. uh, very impressive as well. So uh, thank you very much. I would, uh, I, I look forward to... Um, seeing more of your work and, uh, you. and uh, look forward to more episodes.